our hope in life and death. Christ alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong? Who holds our days within His hands? What comes apart from His command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing the heart. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the Unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. the grave, what will we see? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him, there we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will be Joy when Christ is ours forevermore.
seats. Good morning. We are Mari and Trevor, and we get to lead us in a reflection of Advent this morning. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, which means coming. We remember during Advent that we are waiting for Jesus to come, because when he comes, he will put an end to everything that divides us and will bring peace. And oh, how we need peace. We live in a world riddled with conflicts, where divisions between peoples often escalate to armed violence. But it's not just out there in the world, is it? It's a part of our lives. Most of us have experienced the pain of broken relationships, whether it's with a parent, a child, a friend, or a coworker, we know conflicts firsthand. And not only that, it's within us. We live fragmented, divided lives. Do you ever feel that life moves at one speed, fast? It can all be overwhelming and produce fear. In short, we are desperate for peace. Listen to these amazing promises of peace. And imagine how great this would have sounded to those people whose land had been ravaged by war. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, it says, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up on the mountain of the Lord to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. The Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. The Lord will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation, nor train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. At the birth of Christ, the angels announced, peace on earth. And someday, the Lord is coming again to finish what he started. War will be no more. Broken relationships will be a thing of the past. Our fractured franticness will be replaced with wholeness and health. But for now, we wait in expectation for his coming. In a moment of quiet, be honest with God about what causes you to feel overwhelmed and fearful. Lay before him any relationships that have been broken, and let us drink in the silence together and be reminded that God's victory and peace is coming. We again light the hope candle, and now the peace candle as well, to remind us that God's light is coming into the world. Come, Lord Jesus. You are our peace. Lord, reign in us. Break all our pride and every desire for retribution. Have your way with us. Make us instruments of your peace. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and stand, and the kids are going to head out, and they can follow... Ms. Paige, Miss Donna, out this front here, and the rest of us will uh, continue to sing. It came upon a midnight clear, that glorious song of old, from angels bending. Hallelujah, praise and hear me. 
Patterson, I get to lead us in some prayer this morning. And most of our prayer is this morning is just going to be directly praying Zechariah's song from Luke chapter 1. This is often prayed during Advent in churches around the world. I mean, he prayed this at the birth of his son, who would be called John the Baptist, the one who would prepare the way for the Lord. So would you pray with me? His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. So Lord, we join that prayer of Zechariah today, asking for your salvation, your tender mercy, your guidance. Enable us to serve you without fear in holiness and righteousness before you all our days. We pray this Advent that you would make us a prayerful people, waiting and trusting and hoping in you alone. We humble ourselves before you today. 
We need you. We want to hear from you. Your word is life to us. Would you teach us, convict us, and shape us through your word as your servant Benji opens it for us this morning. And all of this we ask for the sake of your kingdom in Santa Barbara and the world so that all who are living in darkness and in the shadow of death would know the dawn of salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to follow that with a couple of announcements. You may have seen this morning as you came in through the foyer, there's a little market set up. Um, this is from the organization Because of Hope, and they are selling um, some wonderful handmade goods. Um, have them tell you some of the stories and about their organization as you as you go out. And um, hope you hope you find something fun there to give for Christmas, as it also is supporting a really great organization. Um, Next, just in case you've missed these announcements as they've been going on, we're doing a Christmas choir for our Christmas Eve services. They are actually rehearsing right now during the 9 a.m. service, so this is funny, but if you want to be part of the choir and you haven't yet, you could just sneak out now. They're <laughs> rehearsing in the fifth and sixth grade classroom over in the, um, the church <laughs> office building, but they will also be rehearsing during the 9 a.m. service uh, for the next two weeks. Um, so if you have more questions about that, you can ask Mike. Um, and speaking of the Christmas Eve services, we will be doing three services, one o'clock, three o'clock, and five o'clock. I think there's a slide. I'll just wait to make sure I got that right. <laughs> okay, there it is. <laughs> yes, Christmas Eve services, one o'clock, three o'clock, and five o'clock. I hope you join us. Think about uh, bringing neighbors, friends. Um, Christmas Eve is a great time for that. Uh, lastly... Actually, two more. College group is tonight, so if you are a college student um, or college age, tonight is at Caleb and Marie Bagdanov's house, 8 p.m. Um, address is up there, and you can ask him if you want to hear more about that. And he is also doing a young adults dinner conversation on December 11th in the community room. That's uh, in this building, just kind of on the end of this building, um, to the left of the breezeway there. So. Put that on your radar, and that's it. Well, would you stand and just welcome the people around you this morning? All right, I want to invite you to return to your seats. You can return to your seats. We are going to, in a moment, give our attention to the Word of God. And, and so again, I just want to say welcome, Santa Barbara Community Church. It's good to be together. My name is Benji. I'm one of the pastors here. And today is the second week in Advent. And Advent is a season of preparation, but not preparation for Christmas like we actually might think. It is a season of preparation for what Mike helped us consider last week from Titus 2, 
what Paul calls the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so today, as you've already heard, as you can see from the banner, as Trevor and Mari helped us reflect on, we are going to spend the next few minutes together considering peace. When I was in seminary, I took a creative writing class as one of my courses. And one evening, we met at the Dallas Museum of Art. And we were given this assignment. Walk around the museum, find a piece that captures your attention, and then write about it. That was, that was our assignment. Now, I, you need to know, I love the DMA, the Dallas Museum of Art. It's really wonderful. I could have walked around it for plenty of time without the assignment, but I was there that evening for a particular assignment. And that night, the piece that really captured my attention was this one. If we can bring the lights down just a little bit, you'll be able to see this better. This is called The Peaceable Kingdom, and it was created in the 1840s by an American Quaker artist named Edward Hicks. Now, I was trying to reach back in my memory about 17 years, and I don't know exactly what it was that evening that caused this to be the thing that caught my attention. It might have been the surprising collection of animals that are on display there. It might have been the Pennsylvania Valley background, really fascinating as a Quaker. He's telling a story about William Penn, who you can see in the background. Or maybe, as a really tired seminary student, it felt like really low-hanging fruit to do something on Isaiah 11. <laughs> I don't know about then, but I do know that when I look at it now, when I've looked at it again over and over this week, it still triggers something in my soul. And I think that's perhaps because peace feels rather elusive, doesn't it? Today marks 284 days of war in Ukraine. We are gearing up for another contentious election cycle. There was heartbreak in the World Cup yesterday. <laughs> and if you didn't know, I don't feel bad for spoiling it because we're a day later. Closer to home, we are in a really challenging season of church life. And in this room, I know there are so many stories, I've heard them, of medical concerns family heartaches, job uncertainties, and the pangs of loss and grief that are uniquely brought on by the holidays. And so for many of us, this just doesn't feel like a very peaceful time. So providentially, we come today to a text that deals with peace amidst the grittiness of real life. So if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to open it to Ephesians chapter 2. The book of Ephesians contains some of the most dense and beautiful theology that was ever penned by the Apostle Paul. He spends the first chapter and a half exulting in the saving grace and glorious plans of God, giving thanks for the faith that marks the lives of the believers in Ephesus. And yet, as we get to the second half of chapter 2, we see that all that magisterial beauty, well, it was taking place against the backdrop of real human relationships, the kind that aren't always harmonious. And so we're going to pick up our reading of Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 11 today. So if you are able, would you please stand to honor the reading of God's word? From Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Therefore remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together 
to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join me in a brief prayer as you return to your seats. Lord, we have come today because we long to hear a word from you, not from me. Would you anoint my lips and animate your word in our hearts? And would you help us by the power of your spirit to see Christ more clearly, to long for your kingdom more deeply and to follow you more closely? Like Samuel, we say, speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. So let's talk about peace in messed up places. So ancient Ephesus is located near the western coast of modern-day Turkey. It was a significant city politically, religiously, economically in the time of Paul's writing. And so you can go home this afternoon and read in the book of Acts, chapters 18 and 19, how the church got founded there by Apollos and then was grown and furthered by the Apostle Paul. So throughout those chapters, one thing that becomes very evident is that the city featured a mixture of both Jews and and Gentiles. In fact, there had been a large Jewish population in the city of Ephesus since long before the time of Christ. Now, the, the enmity, the hostility between Jews and Gentiles in biblical times, it would be difficult for me to overstate. Particular strains of Jewish thinking had extended laws about ritual purity so far as to preclude almost any contact with Gentiles. We see this expressed really well by Peter in Acts chapter 10. So Peter gets this divine vision, challenging his long-held and deeply ingrained beliefs about the uncleanness of Gentiles. And after that, Peter makes his way to the home of a Gentile centurion. And then we see in verse 28 that Peter lays out the deal. He says this, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. This is not so much a tactic from how to win friends and influence people. He just lays out like, hey, I'm not sure why I'm here. I shouldn't be here because you are not the kind of person I associate with. Jews had deep hostility toward and suspicion of Gentiles. But likewise, Jews were typically regarded with suspicion and hostility by their pagan and polytheistic neighbors as well. And so if that sounds like a recipe for challenge in the marketplace or in the workplace... This text reveals that the division even made things difficult in the church. And we know this because the text tells us that people had resorted to name-calling, like real playground-level stuff. So here's a literal translation of the Greek text of verse 11. You Gentiles in the flesh, the ones called foreskin by those called circumcised. And you thought our meet-and-greet times are awkward. Think about that. (laughs) This is literally the name that was being used by Jews to describe their Gentile brothers and sisters in the church. Now, I point this out not to indulge my inner junior hire, but to demonstrate that the context of Jewish and Gentile relations is about as rocky as possible. And it's making things difficult even in the church. And along comes Paul to make some pretty dramatic claims for those who are a part of the family of God by faith in Christ. And the first dramatic claim is this, that the cross makes peace. In verse 16, we see that the cross makes peace with God. As Paul declares, one of God's purposes at the cross is to reconcile both Jews and Gentiles to God through the cross. The story goes that on his deathbed, the poet and naturalist Henry David Thoreau was asked by a faithful and pious relative if he had peace with God, to which Thoreau replied, I didn't know we'd quarreled. Well, in verse 17, Paul declares that more than quarreled, all people have a universal need to experience peace with God. Paul says, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who are near. In other words, whether Jew or Gentile, by virtue of being human, all people have need of peace, need of reconciliation. This is a need that traces back to our original parents. The Bible opens with a picture of human closeness to God. As the pinnacle of creation, the man and the woman, they enjoy the personal presence of God in an idyllic setting in the garden. But that ideal state is quickly blown apart when the man and the woman act in rebellion against God. They usher in sin, brokenness, and death into the world that God created out of love. And since that 
moment, all the sons of Adam and all the daughters of Eve have inherited from our first parents a sin nature that leads us to sinful acts. Acts that are more than just a mere inconvenience to God. They are an affront to his holiness. What dear Thoreau did not seem to recognize is that more than having quarreled, the scripture insists that by virtue of our inherited sinful nature passed down to us, each of us is participants in cosmic rebellion. We have become enemies of God himself. And yet the good news of the gospel is that rather than respond with justified wrath, God has responded in grace and offered his own son to make atonement for our sins. He poured out the wrath we deserved on a substitute, one who could bear the penalty. Listen to how the apostle John describes the grace of God in the epistle of 1 John. He says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. When we were his enemies, God delivered us from our rebellion through a substitute. So this is why Paul declares in verse 14 of our passage, he himself is our peace. If you hear nothing else I say this morning, hear this. Christ Jesus came into the world to reconcile people back to God. And I wonder if you know the peace of that reconciliation today. Have you tasted the peace that comes from having your sins covered over by the blood of Jesus? The peace that comes from clothing yourself in his righteousness in place of your rags. The peace that comes from being able to approach your creator in confidence of his acceptance of you as his child rather than in fear of his wrath against you as his enemy. I want you to know if you don't yet know that peace, you can know it today. After this service, we're going to have prayer teams over here. They would love to pray with you. If you think, man, that feels too vulnerable. I don't want to go up there. Talk to the person sitting next to you. If they don't know, come find one of our staff people. We would love We would love more than anything else for men and women, young and old, to find peace with God today, the kind of peace that Jesus came to give by reconciling us back to God through the cross. Now, you may be saying, that is truly good news, that's great, but how does it relate to this weird situation between the Jews and the Gentiles body shaming each other in the church in Ephesus? Well, Paul's argument in this passage is simply this. The same sacrifice that creates peace with God creates peace with one another. It's it's that simple. In fact, this, even more than peace with God, this is the main theme of this passage. Just a few examples. Look at verse 14. He made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Verse 15, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Verse 19, no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. Or verse 22, in him, you two are being built together. These two alienated groups are now one. They are no longer circumcision and uncircumcised, but now the one people of God, being built together into a dwelling place fit for our reconciling king. Now, because of our historical location, I don't know how easily we grasp the magnitude of this, but Paul insists That in the church, the long-standing, generations-old social and religious life defining hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles has been broken down to make one new creation. This is a dramatic claim. But it's also something that Jesus himself prayed for. In John 17, after praying for the preservation and the ministry of the apostles, Jesus asks his father this, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. In a world marked by rivalry and division, by feuds and hostility, Shocking unity among those who ought to be enemies speaks of something otherworldly. 
Lynn Kohick, in her wonderful commentary on the book of Ephesians, she puts it this way. Paul describes redemption in Christ by declaring that Christ is our peace. This peace creates something new, a single entity reconciled to God. And this peace kills something old, the enmity that existed between humans, all made in God's image. And this brings us to our second point this morning, and that is that the cross makes peacemakers. Would you look again at verses 19 through 22? Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. When I was in third grade, I changed schools halfway through the year, which is a tricky time to jump in. So as the new kid, I was hyper-focused on all the things that made me feel like an outsider. The class full of existing relationships, the inside jokes and backstories and context I didn't have, the different fashion trends at my new school than the one where I'd come from. At every turn, whether in the classroom or on the playground, I felt like I didn't belong. Until Robbie Anderson took that into his own hands. Robbie Anderson just decided he was going to be my friend. And once Robbie was my friend, suddenly the door was open to new relationships. And I didn't feel like an outsider for very long. And in these verses, Paul claims that the outsiders have in fact been brought in. But far more dramatic than Robbie Anderson showing mercy to the new kid at Henderson Elementary School. The inclusion that Paul outlines made former enemies into family. I know that I regularly bring up the family language in the Bible, and some of you have indicated you're somewhat tired of hearing it, but I can't help but notice it on almost every page I read. Here, Paul declares that no matter their previous identity or hostility, these Jews and Gentiles who are in Christ are now part of one household. They are now family with one another, a family created by the one who came to make peace, a family now set free to be peacemakers. Scott McKnight comments on this in his book, Pastor Paul. He says, now that in Christ, the siblings are reconciled to God, they are to be reconciled to each other. What distinguishes Christian community is that sibling is the word to think with and to embody. And because sibling is no longer blood sibling, but in Christ sibling, the way of siblings applies to everyone in the family. Forgiveness is the operative word in the ecclesia of siblings. Paul doesn't speak in half measures in these verses, nor does he speak in aspirational future tense, like, boy, wouldn't it be great if reconciliation with God would actually encourage people to be reconciled to each other? He doesn't talk that way. Paul presents God's peacemaking work as complete, which means that all that's left for believers to do is to live according to what's already true. Therefore, what that means for us is that to live in hostility or unreconciled acrimony with our fellow citizens of the kingdom of God is to call God a liar and to consider his work of redemption ineffective. It is to live in a metaphorical house with a different foundation and a different cornerstone. It is beneath the calling placed upon those who have known reconciliation. It quite simply is unlike Christ, and therefore unchristian. Now, I know, that might have sounded drastic to you. It felt pretty drastic when I typed it. But we have to see that Paul, Paul is not going out on a limb here. He's not going rogue. In fact, he is standing with Jesus, as he always does. A couple weeks back, I preached a sermon on Jesus' teaching on forgiveness in Matthew chapter 18. We looked at a parable of a servant who had been extended forgiveness and yet refused to be forgiving, refused to extend mercy. And that story ended with the master throwing this unforgiving servant into prison. And then the passage concludes with these really dire words from Jesus. He says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I've been thinking about that ever since. That's terribly inconvenient. But we need to know, church, it's not just there. It's 
It's not only there that Jesus takes forgiveness and reconciliation seriously. Way back in the Sermon on the Mount, he instructed his people, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then, come and offer your gift. Notice that Jesus says, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, it is much easier for me to dwell on what I have against my brothers and sisters. But that's not Jesus' standard here. He calls for careful self-reflection and introspection about our lives and a radical commitment to reconciliation when we discover that we've wronged a sibling. Notice also that his command is not go and have a conversation on the patio about the troubled relationship. It is not go and find a way to avoid interacting with the person you've offended. It is not go and join a different home group. It is go and be reconciled. Klein Snodgrass in his commentary on Ephesians says, the piece discussed in this text is not about good inner feelings. It is about relations. The vertical relation with God is bound to and expressed in horizontal relations with people. Note, too, that the text does not say he is my peace. It says he is our peace. A church is a group of people who know this and embody peace in anticipation of that day when God establishes peace in all his creation. In the church, God's work of peace has a beachhead and is already represented. Christians, by definition, are people of peace. Now, the kind of peace I'm talking about here this morning, it isn't the easy to settle for false peace that might be held out in a Corona beer commercial. Very few hammocks and gently swaying palm trees. Probably very little Snoop Dogg, too. (laughs) If we even marginally begin to consider the price of our own peace with God, we begin to see immediately that peacemaking is a rigorous and costly work. Peacemaking requires Christ-like Humility, Christ-like perseverance, Christ-like embodiment of both grace and truth, and Christ-like self-sacrifice. True peacemaking will push us to uncomfortable places, places where we have to be careful listeners, places where we may have to own our own wrong, and places where we demonstrate a dedication to making amends in hopes of restoring relationships. For Paul, unlikely siblings living in unlikely peace with one another is an unmistakable hallmark of having peace with God. And I want to ask us, brothers and sisters, are we dedicated to peacemaking? Are we committed to reconciliation when we've acted in ways that don't look like our older brother, Jesus? Have we been willing to leave our gifts at the altar in pursuit of of reconciliation. I know I regularly stop short of true peacemaking. I find it easier to avoid those who I know I've hurt or who have hurt me. I find it easier to self-protect than to self-sacrifice. I find it easier to keep receipts and a record of wrongs than to admit my own wrongs and to humbly seek forgiveness from my siblings. And I suspect I'm not alone. But fam, this text challenges me to see that those who have known peace with God are commanded to live in peace with their spiritual siblings. Anything less shows that we are not living up to our family name. So the cross makes peace, and the cross makes peacemakers, but I want us to consider one last truth this morning, and that is that the cross makes promises of more peace. Of the four themes that we are going to consider this month, peace might be the most deeply adventy to me. What I mean by that is that even believers, those who have peace with God because of the blood of Christ and who are liberated to be peacemakers with their own brothers and sisters, well, we still live in a world that is constantly reminding us that peace has not yet come in full. So even as we rejoice that peace has already come, we ache for deeper peace still. I think the tension is captured really well in these lyrics from everyone's favorite Irish worship band. It says, Jesus, this song you wrote, 
The words are sticking in my throat, peace on earth. Hear it every Christmas time, but hope and history won't rhyme. So what's it worth, this peace on earth? Well, in verse 18 of our passage, Paul reminds his readers that because of the cross, believers have access to the Father by one spirit. And while access to the Father is more than rebels should rightly hope for, it is not the full inheritance of heirs. It is not the full redemption that we are awaiting. Listen to how the author of Hebrews puts it. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, to make peace with God. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Notice that in this passage, salvation is still up ahead. Christians are people of the in-between, those who know the joy of salvation now while simultaneously waiting for salvation to come. And the salvation that we long for, well, it's more than mere access. What we long for is the restoration of what was lost in the garden. We long for the day when all the sad things come untrue. And yet the wait is long. And headline after headline and disappointment after disappointment and heartache after heartache can all conspire to rob us, not only of peace in the present, but the hope of peace to come. In a world still waiting in which hope and history won't rhyme, it is easy to find ourselves cynical or disillusioned. And into our cynicism and our weariness, the cross and the empty tomb scream out, that sin and death are not the final word. The day is coming when the prince of peace will reign over a more peaceable kingdom than any Quaker artist dared to dream possible. Listen to how the apostle John describes it. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. This is the hope of the peace to come that we are reminded of when we come to this table week by week. We come to a family table, to a family meal with the other citizens of God's household, with our brothers and sisters. And we come to remember the peace we have with God through the cross of Christ. That, as our passage says, now in Christ Jesus, each of us, who once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. Jesus waged peace by willingly offering himself as a sacrifice to atone for our sins. So through bread and wine, we remember the one whose body was pierced and whose blood was shed to reconcile us to God and to make us into reconcilers. As we wait for a day when peace is no longer a future promise, but our constant reality. If you are a part of the household of God, the family of God, if you are siblings of Jesus Christ because of his redemptive work on the cross, this table is for you and you are invited to our family meal. We'll have prayer teams on either side. They'd love to pray with you about any joys or burdens you want to bring to them as we continue in our worship.
church keep silence and with fear and trembling stand ponder nothing earthly minded for with blessing in his hand Christ our God to
silent for a moment and think of what we have proclaimed Christ to be, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the mighty God, the Lord of everything, Emmanuel, God with us, the great I am, the Prince of peace, the Lamb of God, our saving grace, the one who reigns forever the ancient of days, the alpha and the omega and the beginning and the end, our savior, our Messiah, our redeemer, and our friend. And in this moment of quiet, will you just, again, lay your life before this one who is sovereign and ask him to give you his peace Ask him to make you a peacemaker. Lord, we thank you for what it cost you to make peace with us. We pray that we would live lives that are marked by gratitude to you, obedience to you, and that you would equip us to be like you, be those who are forgivers and reconcilers, uniters, peacemakers. And Lord, help us to wait well in the meantime, in all the mess of, of this world and in our lives, we pray that you would, you would help us be patient to endure and to continue loving and showing kindness, speaking truth and all the things that you did when you were on the earth. Sing one more time. He is Lord of Lords, He is King of Kings, He is mighty God, Lord of everything, He's Emmanuel, He's the great I am, He's the Prince of Peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and lift up his countenance upon you. May he give you his grace and may he fill you with his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Have a great week.